Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is um, a pleasure and a privilege to me to introduce to you Peter Matheson, um, whom I particularly admire, as I'm sure those of you who have read his work also admire, both as uh, an extremely distinguished writer uh, and personally as a man. Um, he's had an interesting and a vital life of action. Uh, he's a literary artist who's also at the same time a naturalist, an explorer, something of a mystic, and also a man passionately active in the defense of wildlife and wilderness preservation and social justice, which uh, he sees as matters that are intimately interconnected. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that everything he does and writes is consistent with a holistic vision of the world and all its varieties of life including the human species. I'll, I'll very briefly outline his career. For, probably most of you do uh, have an idea, but just, uh, just uh, because I, I have to do it, I will. Um, he uh, studied at Yale and the Sorbonne, um, uh, spent some time in uh, early life in Paris, where he helped to establish the uh, distinguished literary magazine, the Paris Review, which uh, remarkably uh, still exists, best known for its uh, distinguished interviews, of course, but also for all sorts of other things. Um, well, he uh, tried to make a start as a novelist, moved back to uh, the States, um, where he, um, while trying to make it as a novelist, uh, earned his living uh, as a commercial fisherman and uh, Skipper. Um, well, as uh, so often the case, it, 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 he, he couldn't make a living uh, at writing novels. Uh, and so, uh, faced with the, the question what to do, become a full-time fisherman <laughs> or go into teaching like uh, so many of us, uh, he uh, instead, fortunately for us, uh, turned to writing about animals and birds and accounts of his travels. He had a long and fruitful relationship with the New Yorker magazine, and uh, his travels took him all over the world to uh, New Guinea, where he lived among Stone Age people, which uh, uh, became a novel, Under the Mountain Wall. Uh, he's been to the American, South American rainforest, uh, also setting for, uh, an, sorry, Under the Mountain Wall is not a novel, uh, the South American rainforest is the setting for a novel uh, at play in the fields of the Lord, which has been translated into Dutch. Um, Urwald, I think. Um, he's been to Nepal in search of the elusive snow leopard, to Japan twice, I believe, as a student of Zen, and to Africa for extended periods described in uh, a number of books. Um, th these travels also produced, bore fruit in the form of the novel Fa Tortuga, first published in 1975, um, a very remarkable novel, tale of Caribbean fishermen, written in a highly original, compact, poetic language, also, I think, the fruit of direct, it certainly looks like it, the fruit of direct participatory observation. Peter Matheson is essentially a serious and very accurate observer, always deeply concerned about the relation between man and nature. And even when writing about himself as a travel writer can hardly avoid doing, he does so, it seems to me, with a lack of egocentricity that is extraordinarily attractive. Uh, Far Tortuga, uh, a novel not as well known as it should be, um, uh, though, like Matheson's other work, has been much admired by his peers, perhaps more than by the critics. Are there any quotes here? Thomas Pynchon, the novel is Matheson at his best. 
with inspiring, unique, original, enormously haunting Styron, Finchon. His other admirers include uh, Don DeLillo, uh, Saul Bellow, uh, pretty good names. Um, uh, understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Fa Tortuga uh, demonstrates, I think, uh, it's a matter perhaps which we shall go into later, I hope, um, in our discussion. Uh, uh, it, it seems to me that in this novel, um, I can't read you a bit from this novel because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be representative. It's impossible. You have to see it on the page. You have to read it. Um, uh, in this book and in his others, in his other novels, I think that Matheson is remarkably humble uh, in his attitude to his human material, which is a really exceptional thing for a novelist. He's the most unusual novelist, I think this has to be said. Um, novelists tend to be somewhat, one way or another, manipulative. You know, they like to play God in their imaginary world. Uh, Matheson, perhaps because he's a Buddhist, doesn't play God. Um, most recently, he has completed a massive fictional project, which has been a, an obsession with him for 20 years, the Mr. Watson trilogy. Well, the third volume in this trilogy has just been published. It's called Bone by Bone. Here it is. And it, uh, the whole trilogy, including this large novel, as you can see, and the other two are just as large, uh, the whole trilogy is concerned with the death and the life of one Edgar Watson, a man born in South Carolina, middle of the last century, gunned down in 1855, to be precise, and gunned down by a posse of his neighbors in a corner of the Everglades, a swampy and lawless, impenetrable wilderness in Florida, still one of the largest remaining wildernesses in the world, I believe. Watson was shot down there in, on October the 24th, 1910. This Watson uh, is, is or was a historical figure, although one we don't know a great deal about, I believe, uh, beyond that he was a successful planter and entrepreneur and a man notorious for his violent temper, um, but also liked by many people. A man with a penchant for trouble, according to the local, uh, one of the local historians. Well, it seems that Matheson has been, I, we want to talk about this with him, but uh, fascinated by this man's existence uh, and, um, and his time and place, and has set himself the task, which has turned out to be a Herculean task, of recreating the man, his life, his whole being, his whole milieu, and everything leading up to his death, which seems, which is connected with everything. A heroically ambitious project uh, on a vast scale. Um, and Matheson has never been a man to make things easier for himself, I think. Up to now, He's been better known uh, as a non-fiction writer than as a novelist, a situation which he himself dislikes and deplores and would like to see changed. Perhaps the Watson trilogy will bring that about. Um, anyway, meanwhile, I think one can see uh, a number of reasons for uh, Matheson's difficulty in um, achieving the renown which he certainly deserves. Uh, as a novelist. Uh, he himself uh, blames the reviewers, unimaginative reviewers, and I'm sure there's a great deal of truth in that. But I hope I can say this without sounding too blunt or rude. Uh, I think uh, it's also partly his own fault um, for two reasons. Because, firstly, because he writes such fascinating travel literature and has so much to say about the actual world and about matters of urgent concern to all of us. That's one reason. The other reason, as a novelist, he, he writes with utmost seriousness uh, and makes few concessions 
to the reader. Um, and writers of this kind don't generally have an easy time of it. Um, how am I doing? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going on too long. I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's a shame because I have so much. A uh, couple of things I want to say. Um, uh, his travel writing. I have to say a word about his travel writing. So we run a little late tonight. Uh, it's full of hair raising experiences described with hallucinating vividness. Going down in a, in a, in a cage, reaching out and stroking the great white shark, you know, jaws in, in person, uh, creeping along ledges in the Himalayas with, you know, Tremendous, it's hair-raising stuff, uh, powerfully described. Uh, I have to read a passage from The Snow Leopard, a book I have to mention this. He, perhaps rather I didn't mention it because it's like an albatross around his neck, uh, his best-known book. But it's a marvelous book, it has to be said. I must, guess, I must mention it and get it over with. Um, you, many of you will know it, uh, but even if you do, let me refresh your memory with, of its particular crystalline quality of description and thought. Um, a small passage from The Snow Leopard. My foot slips on a narrow ledge. In that split second, as needles of fear pierce heart and temples, eternity intersects with present time. Thought and action are not different. And stone, air, ice, sun, fear, and self are one. What is exhilarating is to extend this acute awareness into ordinary moments in the moment-by-moment -moment experiencing of the Lamagea and the wolf, which, finding themselves at the center of things, have no need for any secret of true being. In this very breath that we take now lies the secret that all great teachers try to tell us, what one Lama refers to as the precision and openness and intelligence of the present. It's heady stuff. Uh, and uh, the description of nature and the thoughts are uh, intimately connected with it. Remind, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody's ever done that better. D.H. Lawrence, perhaps. Reminds me strongly of Lawrence, but it's su sui generis, that's for sure. Um, well, very quickly, the Watson uh, trilogy, um, this enormous trilogy, a career, an act of great artistic courage to write a book of this scale. Also, a characteristically American work of art, I think. America is such a large country and so raw that uh, it, you know, there are American artists who work on a scale we simply don't know in Europe. Think of, uh, and also in uh, a way that looks uh, inchoate, it does not seem uh, uh, formally graspable. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting this across, but think of Jackson Pollock, think of Barnett Newman, think of the uh, totalizing music of Charles Ives, or the endless solos of, of John Coltrane. Uh, all characteristic American works of art, it seems to me. Uh, in literature, uh, American writers have the tremendous advantage of having America to write about, American experience in the American country. So you have huge projects. Uh, and uh, Writers of the moment, Don DeLillo, with his large novels, Richard Ford, Independence Day, uh, even Philip Roth, uh, uh, um, American pastoral, John Updike's uh, recent uh, historical um, novel. The size of American art uh, uh, we see it here in the Watson trilogy. It's very much in the American grain. Um, I was going to, uh, uh, I won't because I'm running out of time, I really am. Uh, I was going to uh, read, uh, uh, read you a, a short description of the Watson trilogy, but it will no doubt come up. Uh, so I think I've said enough, more than enough, and uh, it's a shame. I was such a passage, no, there's one, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, there's one passage I insist on reading to you, because you perhaps won't read it to you. Just to give you a taste of the, of the writing in this book. This book, uh, these books, uh, the Watson books, uh, the, uh, the material uh, is, is rendered with extraordinary directness. It is not, as it were, mediated. The same is true of Far Tortuga. Far Tortuga is about these Caribbean fishermen. There seems to be nothing in the book which could not be in the minds, in the consciousness, in the experience of these people. We submit to them. Um, bone by bone, the world is uh, frequently of extraordinary violence. It's an extremely unpleasant world in many ways, I think. Uh, and yet, and, but fascinating. Here's a description of a lynching of a, 
A soldier of mixed blood, racial, racial hatred is, uh, uh, is, is a constant theme uh, in this trilogy. The lynching of uh, a young soldier, a buffalo soldier, uh, partly colored, partly Indian, 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 as he puts it, as they put it, but an American citizen. He is up against uh, an, an unpleasant mob. So they said, so this is Watson talking. So they said, boy, your rights here, your rights just ain't the point here. Are you a nigger that has nigger blood or ain't you? And that soldier paused, realizing they would have their fun no matter what. He took a deep breath and he said, I may look like you red-faced sons of bitches, but I'm proud to say I am nigger to the bone. He bellowed that right at the crowd, nigger to the bone. To punish him, they ripped his pants down to castrate him. They had a special hatred for this man with skin like theirs. And being drunk, they made a bloody mess of it. When finally a moan was wrung from his clenched mouth, they laughed to beat hell. Old Man House remembered. Their lank-haired women stood around barefoot and grim, arms folded on their chests, or nursing young. With such a fine turnout for the barbecue, folks got into festive spirits and prolonged it lowering the rope so that his bare feet touched the ground. They gave him enough slack to gasp up a breath so he could scream or beg to them. And when he didn't do that, they yanked him up again until his face turned blue. His eyes bugged out and his mouth opened and closed just like a fish until finally it fell open for good, skewed kind of sideways. Being so ornery, he wouldn't come back to life, making no response whatever to poked sticks or torches. Disgusted, they let the crowd do what they wanted with him. Folks came and stood there next to him, got their pictures taken for half a dollar. Dad with a buttered corn cob in one hand, mom and kiddies, only two bits each. Finished up by hacking off nice souvenirs and finally target practice. Man and boys, they whacked him with so many rounds that the body turned and turned in that summer heat. That was the sport of it by the end. Keep that nigger turning. <sighs> Peter Matheson. Thank you, Anthony Paul, um, for a very, very kind and generous introduction. And um, would they, uh, some of the critics of the book reviewers are like you. <laughs> um, and thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you, Anna Wertheim. I'm very happy to be back in Holland again, and with some good friends I've had before, and my dear friends, Christopher McElhoes and Katharina Bielenberg, who are from the, our publishers. And um, anyway, welcome everybody. Um, if you've all seen my formal lecture jacket, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, I will. Uh, please don't shy away from the book. That that is a very strong passage that Anthony shows. <laughs> Uh, not it's, all like that. No, they're not all like that. And uh, Watson is also uh, quite a humorous man. He, uh, he has, although he has this dark side. I, I think I'll talk a little bit about this trilogy because it is, it has been, an uh, obsession with me for a very long time. And my wife uh, thinks I'm completely mad now, and I should probably start talking about it. But I have, and I admit it, and especially in the past year, I had my ups and downs with my publisher in New York and so forth, and one thing or another, and I've been fighting for my fiction like a mother with a, a babe, and I have been really quite manic, and I'm quite ashamed of it, and I hope, well, I will never talk about it again after tonight. <laughs> but uh, um, I do want to talk about the inception of this. Why would you spend 20 years writing about a man like Edgar Watson, such as Edgar Watson. But I saw Watson as a metaphor for the whole American frontier, and even for Uncle Sam, if, without being too pretentious. Um, and there was certainly the racism and all of these themes that we have to deal with there, which have been so ugly and so crippling to our development of our consciousness as a nation, in my view. Um, let me tell you, first of all, how I heard about Watson, and this was quite interesting. 
I was traveling with my, my father had a boat, and he loved that kind of backcountry, Florida coast. And we were traveling up, if you know, if you, if you can envision Florida for a moment, you'll see that great peninsula, about 600 miles long, coming down out of the American southeast states and enclosing the Gulf of Mexico. And we were traveling up the west coast, in other words, the Gulf Coast, rather than the Atlantic Ocean Coast. And we were passing the Everglade region. Now, the Everglades are an amazing phenomenon, which are a place I love. There's nothing like it in the world. The Everglades are the only Everglades in the world, the only place where a river, perhaps 40 miles across, is moving very slowly, and sometimes no more than a couple of feet deep, over a limestone base from the old sea floors that have come up there. And it comes down through the whole last a third of Florida, from Lake Okeechobee and the Kissimmee River, and drains that part of Florida. And these giant rivers come down through the glades, at least until man started manipulating the, the water system there. And they flow in this direction, kind of out toward the Gulf. So you have a series of huge rivers coming out through these mangrove swamps into the Gulf of Mexico. And it's enormously inhospitable territory. Mangrove coast is inhospitable to start with. Many poisonous snakes, and in the old days, of course, the, the last of the Seminole and Miccosukee Indian people had been driven down there. They were the refugees. They were the only Indians who were never defeated by the US Army. They made monkeys of the U.S. Army, really. And they persisted, and they were never defeated. They were simply legislated out of existence about 1918. Came out onto the roads, looked around, and their world had been taken away from them by fiat. And there weren't very many of them anymore. And you can see them today. They camped along the Tamiami Trail, which, which is the cross Everglades Road that connects Miami to um, Tampa. Tampa, Miami, Tamiami trail in the west. Um, but south of that uh, Tamiami Trail, the Everglades is untouched. It's the biggest roadless area in North America, uh, at least not, not in, the, in, the, in the continental United States. We forget that. We think the biggest roadless area must be in Montana or someplace, but it's not. It's the Everglades. And it's still that way, largely untouched because it was given over to the Everglades National Park and the Big Cypress National whatever it may be, but it adjoins it, and together they are still vast. Anyway, we were traveling up this coast, coast off these wild rivers, and my father pointed out where a river called Chatham River comes down to the coast, and he said, if you up that river about four miles, there's a house. It's the only house in the Everglades. It belonged to a man named Watson, who was killed by his neighbors. He seems to have been a bad fellow. That was all my father knew about Edgar Watson. Just, just really, that was about it. But it stuck in my brain. If you look at the map, if I looked at the, the charts, the marine charts, and then the maps, the house up there by itself, right away, it was kind of an astonishment. What was it doing up there? And he'd seen it. My dad had seen it. He'd been up there some years before, and he saw the house while it was still up. He said, it's really a pretty good-sized house for backcountry you know, America up there, and also killed by his neighbors. Now, this is not a usual event. People are killed on their own turf, or they're killed in some sort of criminal warfare, or they but to be executed by your neighbors, unless your neighbors are criminal types, is unusual. And uh, he didn't know any more, but it stuck in my brain. And I find that all, at least my fiction, all fiction starts with that kind of thing. I always thought of it like the <laughs> like the like the, the seed of the egg and the ovary of the chicken, that gradually, accompanied by other eggs of larger and larger size, makes its way down the fallopian tube, and at a certain point, the author lays it. Um, you know, and it, you may have laid an egg, as we say in America. Uh, it may not work out very well. But anyway, this thing, I, I didn't get going on it at once, and in a way, it was a great pity, because when I first heard about Edgar Watson, all of his children were still alive. Um, and I could have, although they would not have talked to me. You know, in 1910, to have your father destroyed in a hail of his neighbor's bullets was such a scandal 
that they were, the family was in agreement. They would never, never talk to anybody about it. And some of them, some of the inheritance, uh, the descendants changed their name and they did everything they could to cover it up. His daughter, Carrie, Carrie Watson, married a man named Walter Langford and, she, and he was the president of the First National Bank in Fort Myers, Florida. They were very respectable people. Another son ran an insurance uh, company there. Um, and they, they toughed it out. They didn't run away, but they, they kept the name Watson, too. But they didn't talk about it. And that was true of all the relatives, up and down, everywhere. So they would not have talked to me at first. And even when I started, I didn't start researching this thing until about 20 years ago. And I know it was 20. I didn't think it was 20 years. I thought I'd been sort of fooling around for maybe, you know, eight or nine years. And then I saw my earliest notes, and they go back about 20 years. And when I started researching, and I've talked to everybody over 95 in southwest Florida to see what they remembered, um, the, the Watson family itself would have nothing to do with me. They were hard to come by, and they simply wouldn't talk to me at all. And I never expected I would talk to them. Um, it was only really after the first novel of the three came out that they realized that however bad he might look in that novel, <laughs> he looked better than he did in the public legend. <laughs> and they thought, well, perhaps there's some hope here. And they began to come out of the woodwork. And a few brave ones really wanted to know about their grandfather or their father, as the case may be. And in the end, I actually talked to two of his daughters, two of his daughters by his last marriage, uh, two lovely old ladies, Florida ladies, very much church ladies and very proper, who did not want to be identified by name, but nonetheless, uh, they identified themselves. I was able to show them the first picture of their father they'd ever seen. And uh, the youngest one, and she's still alive, the one sister died now, but the youngest one is still alive in central Florida, a lovely person. And I had a, a moving letter from her after this last novel, Bone by Bone, came out. And she said, you know, you've, thank you. She said, you've given me back my father. She said, hey, for me, he was always just a monster. And now at least he's a human being. Well, she put her finger really on what my ambition was in this trilogy, was to take a man like Watson. He interested me for many reasons. But one, my challenge as a novelist was, can I make this man a human being? Can I show the reader that despite a very violent history and some very bad episodes, in his, I mean really bad, he is not a, a good guy. Uh, can I make him a human being? being? And I think, in some, at least for some people I did, because a lot of people have written in, and even some of the uh, book reviewers have said that they were they were sorry when he was killed by his neighbors, despite his crimes, and they were crimes. But we forget that in the historical context of when he lived, that frontier was very rough, and you had to establish, and there was no law. And he was seeing these people who later became the great tycoons, who were now you know, club members and golfers and stuff, who were making their huge fortunes, not only in Florida, but all across the country, mining and plantations, railroads, you name it. These people were very, very rough on their workers. I mean, they were absolutely ruthless. But they had lieutenants, they had people who just, and this still goes on today, the boss is kept away from the rough stuff. Go out and play golf, boss, get some fresh air, and while he's gone, they, they go in there, give it to the union leaders and the people who are causing trouble on the, on the workforce. Many people died in the creation of our great American fortunes, as they did in the great British fortunes, and as they, I'm sure, did in Holland, everywhere else. Capitalism has a very rough side to it. Those fortunes were not made smoothly, <clears throat> as a general rule. And Watson knew this. Watson wasn't stupid. And also, he was a genius planter. Uh, he was a very, very good planter by all accounts. People who, who He just was able to grow anything. And, and that's what he wanted to be. He didn't want to have a lot of money, particularly. He didn't want that. 
he really wanted to be, and he was a great uh, sugarcane grower, and he developed the syrup. It was the finest syrup that ever came to South Florida. He really was a, a, an accomplished man and an inventor. He also seems to have been the man who killed the outlaw, famous outlaw woman, Belle Starr. And this is when, because of a scrape he'd gotten himself in, in Florida, he had to go to, he moved to Oklahoma, the Indian Territory. While out there, he apparently was involved in the death of Bell Star, moved again and again, fetched up in, he, he was put, then put in prison in Arkansas for horse theft, um, escaped from prison, and in the first accounts, the first account I ever could find of Edgar Watson in the old books was in a wonderful book called Hell on the Border. Now, there's a title I wish I'd thought of. That's a word. How could you miss Hell on the Border? But in Hell on the Border, which was written only a few years after Bell Starr's death, it said that Watson was killed escaping from prison. Well, he escaped all right, and he was not killed because he turned up in Florida again. And, uh, and all this time, he married several times. All these ladies loved him. Uh, and he, all his children loved him too, and his neighbors liked him. He was apparently a terrific storyteller. He knew a lot, and they learned a lot from this man. And he had other ladies who also loved him and also had children by him. Um, he was, a, in one sense, a very popular man. But he just scared the hell out of everybody. He had this terrible temper and a bad drinking habit. And I don't know, I could never establish that he ever killed anybody for, for money, except with one, one sort of nebulous case, and I make that. Uh, the thing is, I, I really didn't know. I had to read between the lines. And of course, the closer I got to the family, then I got some inner family stuff. And one of the luckiest breaks I ever had, I just could not believe my luck. I had to, first of all, all Watson appears in a number of books, but almost always, even in very responsible books, they, they count on the same old few facts, and they have not researched him at all. all he, he, they only talk about his Everglades career. But actually, he spent half of his um, Florida life in North Florida. All of his three wives came from North Florida. He was born in South Carolina. He lived in Oklahoma. None of this stuff appears. And I was able to develop all of the stuff, including the hearing when he was actually taken to court for the Bell Star killing and so forth. Um, I, I found out this wonderful stuff, and I discovered in Lake City, which is northern Florida, a, a picture of him. I came into a cousin's room, and there on the wall was a picture of a man with an old lady and a young woman, a girl, really. And I said, that's Mr. Watson, isn't it? She said, yeah. I'd never seen a picture of him until that time, and his own children had never seen this picture. And I got a copy of it made. Since that time, I've come up with one or two more. I found this research absolutely fascinating. I think that's one of the reasons I, I spent so long on it. Um, but in the, in the end, I finally did not know much of the truth. I had to make up my truth. This is not an historical novel. And I'll, 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 this, I'll, I'll read you just briefly what I, this is how I, I explained what I was doing as a preface to the first of the three books. A man still known in his community as E.J. Watson has been reimagined, and that's really the word, has been reimagined from a few hard facts census and marriage records, dates on gravestones and the like. Gravestones are very valuable because they're very precise they, and they have, they have much more information on them than one might imagine, especially if you're desperate for information. <laughs> <clears throat> All the rest of the popular record is a mix of rumor, gossip, tale, and legend that has evolved over eight decades into myth. This book reflects my own instincts and intuitions about Watson. It is fiction, and the great majority of the episodes and accounts are my own creation. The book is in no way historical, since almost nothing here is history. On the other hand, there is nothing that could not have happened. Nothing inconsistent, that is, with the very little that is actually on record. It is my hope and strong belief that this reimagined life contains much more of the truth of Mr. Watson than the lurid and popular, popularly accepted facts of the Watson legend. 
According to the Watson legend, Watson killed about 55 people. That, in almost all accounts, that's the, that's the figure they come up with. It is, it is true, difficult to separate him from about seven <laughs> deaths. Uh, I won't pretend that he was a good guy. He wasn't. Um, but he had his thing. And of course, my, my task is, and right away, and I suppose I, I try to establish the fact that here was a, a man who, like the rest of us, ran around as a child and had his own longings and his hurt and his humiliations and his rejections and uh, whatever. And so I begin the book, first of all, with an account of how proud he was of his father, who, was a, who that I did establish. His father was an extraordinarily abusive uh, drunk. The, the Watson family was a very strong family in South Carolina. They were a very good old family. They were plant planters. They, they had about 16,000 acres um, split up among various plantations. And his, his father was in this family, but his father seems to have been weak because he died rather, he seems to have been selling off his land rather too young. And then his, then his father, who was Elijah Watson, was known, and he's very his, he crops up in all the court records there, as Ring Eye Lige. And apparently he was called Ring Eye Lige because in a, one of his many tavern brawls, he uh, was knocked out with a horseshoe and uh, his opponent, apparently deciding not to kill him, instead carved this big red circle around his eye. So he was called Ring Eye Lige. And he beat the devil out of young Edgar. And I'm not going to repeat, we know the cliché, uh, children that are, are beaten violently are apt to turn into violent people. And in this case, of course, he did. But he, he begins on the plantation. His father has been a soldier in the, in the Civil War. He's come back from war now, but he's impoverished because he's spent everything on drink and, and brothels and one thing or another. And Edgar is working for his un uncles and relatives. He's just working as a manual worker with the colored people, with the colored guys. And there's a young slave named Joseph who runs away. At this time, toward the end of the Civil War, the slaves were running away like anything. But if they got caught and brought back, they were beaten half to death. They were considered that they wanted to make examples of them, and, uh, and they did. And uh, so <laughs> this is Edgar's account of... Um, what happened when the slave boy he knew and liked the best, he could never, and this is kind of the thing that I, I hope comes through, he could never admit that Joseph was a friend. And just in, in the way the society was in those days, a so-called nigger was not your friend. He couldn't be a friend. He could be a nice or not a nice nigger, but he was a nigger. He was not a friend. Um, <coughs> When the war was nearly at an end and many slaves were escaping to the north, a runaway was slain by overseer Claxton on my great uncle's plantation at Clouds Creek. Word had passed the day before that Doc and Joseph were missing. At the racketing echo of shots from the creek bottoms, I dropped my hoe and lit out across the furrows toward the wood edge, trailing the moaning of the hounds down into swamp shadows and along wet black mud margins dragged at by thorns and scratched by tentacles of old and evil trees. I saw Doc first, dull, stubborn Doc lashed to a tree, then the overseer whipping back his hounds, then two of my great uncles, tall and raw-boned on raw-boned black horses, the overseer's pony shifted in the shadows. Behind the boots and milling legs, the heavy hoof stamp and horse shivers, bit jangle and creak of leather, lay a lumped thing in earth-colored homespun. I was panting so hard that my wet eyes could scarcely make out the broken shoes, the legs hard twisted in the bloody pants, the queer gray thing stuck out askew beneath the chest. How could that thing be, the limber hand that had offered nuts or berries, caught my mistossed balls, set young Master Edgar on his feet 
after a fall. All in a bunch, the fingers had contracted like the toes of a stunned bird, closing on nothing. At daybreak, Mr. Claxton, on the lookout, had seen a small smoke rising from a far corner of the swamp. His horse was saddled, and he did not wait for help, just loosed his hounds and rode on down there. The runaways had fled his dogs, obliging him to shoot and wound them both. That was his story. He was marching them home when this damn Joseph sagged down like a croaker sack, pissing his pants. I told that other and over yonder, shut up your damn mouth, shut up your damn moaning. Told him, stand that son of a bitch on his feet, I ain't got all day. Done my duty, Major, weren't no use. Major Tillman Watson and Elijah Jr. sat their horses, never once dismounted. My great uncles chewed on Claxton's story. The dead boy's wet homespun was patched dark and stuck with dirt, and a faint piss stink mixed with dog smell and the sweet musk of horses. Wet his damn pants, the overseer repeated, to no one in particular, awaiting the judgment of those mounted men. He was a closed-faced man, as hard as wire. You have no business here, great uncle, Elijah Jr. told me. Not because night was coming on, or because I was too young to witness this grim sight, but because I was certainly neglecting whichever shore I had abandoned without leave. To the overseer, he never spoke confining his exasperation to muttered asides in the direction of his older brother concerning the waste of a perfectly good nigger. Major Tillman Watson, home from war, seemed more disturbed by Claxton's viciousness. Damn it, ZP. You trying to tell us these boys was aiming to outrun them hounds of yours? How come you had to go and pull the trigger? He was backing his big horse, reining its wild-eyed head away toward home. Close his eyes, God damn it! He was utterly fed up. Go fetch a cart. I reckon he'll keep till morning, <laughs> Claxton muttered, sullen. Major Tillman frowned down on me in somber temper. What do you want here, boy? <clears throat> Badly enough to run out here barefoot. That's what he meant. It's almost dark, he said, half turned in the saddle. You're not afraid out here, all by yourself? <sighs> yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> the Major grunted. You're a Watson, all right. I'll say that much. All the same, you go on home while there's still light, and don't go worrying your poor mama. The old soldier rode away through the dark trees. Tell them niggers, bring the wagon if they want him. The overseer bawled, not wishing to be heard. Receiving no answer, he swore foully. Niggers will come fetch him or they won't. That sure ain't my job. He did not bother to shut the black boy's eyes. Too bad I weren't this monkey over here, he rasped, stripping the bonds from the wounded doc who yelped with each rough jerk of the hemp line. Though Claxton had grumped in my direction, he had paid me no attention until this moment. What in the name of the hell you want? I ain't never seen a dead nigger before. He climbed gracelessly onto his horse, cracked his hide whip like a mule skinner. No, sir, I ain't going to no damn court, because I ain't broke no law. I just done my job. The slaves stumbled forward with the man on horseback and lean hounds behind. In single file against the silver water of the swamp, they moved away into the dusk. You aim to leave him here alone, I called. Out in the swamp all night, all by himself, with the owls and snakes and, and varmints. That's what I meant. It sounded absurd, and Claxton snorted, cursing his fate, because he dared not curse a Watson, even a Watson as young and poor as me. 
In the dusk, the forest gathered and drew close. Behind me, the body lay in wait. Alone with a woodland corpse at nightfall, I was scared. I peered at the earthen lump between my fingers, retreating from its great loneliness. In the dusk, Joseph seemed to withdraw, as if already rotting down amongst the roots and ferns, skin melding with the black humus of the swamp, as if over the night this bloodied earth must take him back as if all of his race were doomed to be buried here in darkness while white folks were laid in the sunny meadows in the light of heaven. In violent death, my cousin Selden said, even one's beloved looked like a strange thing hurled down out of heaven. <coughs> cousin Selden was well read and liked to talk in that peculiar matter. Not that black Joseph had been my beloved. I don't mean that. Joseph was guilty. The laws were strict, and had he lived, he would have been flogged half to death, as Doc was sure to be. But Joseph had been kind to me. He had been kind. I was still young, and I could not help my unmanly feelings. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> so, uh, I have a few more minutes, do I, or should I? I yeah. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say, so anyway, um, I, saw, I saw this man really as a metaphor for, for, for my country in many, many, many ways. Um, and I did establish, I established, I hope early on, that he, he is human, but he... He turns inhuman. He has to turn on his father, and then he has to, and he's driven away from home. He's, his father allows the suspicion for an uh, idle killing of his cousin Selden, who's a liberal, <laughs> um, and the tar and feathering of Selden and so forth, to fall on him to escape punishment himself. And he flees South Carolina for Florida, and then he has to flee Florida again. Um, and by this time, he's a pretty hard uh, person, no question about that. And uh, the way I structured the book was, originally it was all one book. I wrote this immense draft. Just, just the pages went up and up and up. And I realized fairly early on that Random House, my publishers in New York, were going to have a fit when I submitted this manuscript. And I saw a rather natural break, how it would fall into, into three parts. So I submitted the first part just to get them used to the idea. And um, they loved it. And they loved that. It was called Killing Mr. Watson. They were very excited about that. And um, my editor, uh, Jason Epstein, is a very well-known editor, very bright fellow. And he loved it, and he, he became the editor of it, and so forth. But when I came to write, to prepare the second book, I was, in, I was in a position that all writers dream of. I was so envied. I said, here you are, and I was paid this advance um, for my novel, and it was only one third of the novel. I said, my God, you know, I just turned in a third, and I'm going to get the same amount of money for the second third, and then the third third, and it looked like I was absolutely golden. The only trouble was that the second volume which was much the most difficult part. I had assumed that it stood by itself, but when I went turned to it to prepare it for submission, I realized it didn't. I, I likened it to, you know, the structure, the general structure of a dachshund. There's a firm upright front end and a firm upright back end, and in the middle is this slope, you know, okay? It had kind of a sag to it. It didn't seem to have... And to make that book work, and, and not everybody <laughs> agrees that I succeeded, um, I had to borrow something for that book that really didn't belong there. It really did belong in another part of the novel. And I had to sort of, uh, to, to make it work. I, I think the most interesting things in the whole trilogy are in that book. I really do think that, and I'm convinced of it. 
Um, but nonetheless, I had a problem with it and t- extended the working on the whole thing for a very long time. The first book is really the reports of the neighbors, the few reports from Watson's children, just accounts of episodes. You begin to get a sense of this man through other people's eyes only. Uh, and there's no, and Watson's voice never appears in Killing Mr. Watson. It just, it begins directly after his death. It begins, there's been a huge hurricane on that coast. The people are exhausted, filthy from the hurricane. They've lost their boats, they've lost everything. Their, their little huts and cottages have all been blown away. And then in the midst of this, this, this terrifying thing happens on Watson's plantation. Three people are murdered, and even though they know that Watson didn't do the killing because he was there, they think that he might have been behind it. Anyway, in the paroxysms of, of terror and dread and despair and loss, everything, Watson comes in and he is murdered. And his wife is right there. She's in the little settlement store. And she, uh, that's her cry. She says, oh, my God, my God, they're killing Mr. Watson. You know, in those days, it was formal. She called her husband Mr. Watson. Um, and that's how, that, that's how the book really begins. My, my dear friend and publisher here, Mr. McElhose, was appalled that I had given away the whole story in the very first <laughs> chapter, and he made his displeasure felt in no uncertain terms. <laughs> But I, I did, was not interested in the plot and the story in the least. It, it, the interesting, interesting thing was not that this had happened. It was how does it happen? How is a man killed by his neighbors? And not only killed, the, the autopsy that I did find, uh, they picked 33 bullets out of him. But I think they gave up after that. They thought, well, what's the point? This is academic, you know. Um, <laughs> They really blew him away. It must have been just a paroxysm of terror and rage in the strange twilight evening of October 1910. And, and then it works back to Watson coming in in his boat to this dock, and he knows they're there. And you sort of wonder, he knows the score. Why is he coming in anyway? Is he really so arrogant that he thinks that one more time he's going to get away with this? What happens? And then it's an account of the death. And my idea was, which is very pretentious now that I think about it, but I was going to keep circling back. I had this idea of a symphony. I wanted to structure the trilogy like a symphony, to introduce movements and themes and just keep working back to them and, you know, orchestrating the whole thing this way. And so I was going to begin and end every volume of the three with the death of Watson. A real tour de force, as, as Anthony said, I don't make things easy for This, this is a dumb uh, idea. I, I, I finally had to adjust it, although generally uh, I follow it. The second book is the whole thing seen by, from the eyes of his son Lucius, who was the second son and who adored his father. Lucius has gotten, he's quite well educated and so forth. He's an historian. He knows a lot about Indian people, about the nature of the Everglades. So through his eyes, you, you learn a lot about the Everglades uh, through him. But he is really trying to find out the truth of his father's life. And in the end, he finds out, of course, inevitably, a little more truth than he can handle. Uh, and he finds out, and this is the amazing thing, because I heard this from a lot of people, and I really have no reason to doubt it. There was a black man, uh, Henry Short, black man. He was very light. He's the son of the man who uh, Anthony read, who was lynched. And the man was lynched because he had this child with a white girl. And um, Henry (laughs) was brought to the community by other people, whatever. And he was a very able man, a very good fisherman, a very good hunter, and a very good shot. by legend, the only person on that coast who could outshoot Watson. And uh, all the stories point to the fact that the man who raised his gun first and killed Mr. Watson was Henry Short. You'd have to know American history a little bit to know what an incredible act this would be for a black man in that in those days when you could. You could kill a black person. If you didn't do it in front of church on Sunday, 
you could pretty much kill a black person at will. People would prefer for the looks of the thing if you took them out the river or someplace, but uh, generally that's what it was like. It was medieval. This was the beginning of Jim Crow law. It was incredibly ugly. It's a, it's a true blot and stain in, in our American history. And knowing that, the very fact that Henry had a gun was quite unusual. That he was a good shot was unusual. Who taught him? You know, it'd be like that. Uh, well, he had a gun, and he was invited to join that crowd that came down to the dock, and apparently he shot first and he didn't miss. I mean, a lot of them told me that nobody else had to shoot. The rest was just hysteria. Well, I found this, <clears throat> this event so absolutely astounding. And, and he and Watson, Henry Short and Watson, weren't, they had their dealings, but they weren't, they respected each other. And Lucius gets to know Henry Short, too. Uh, it's, and there's this very painful balance, that black-white thing that happens. So anyway, the second book is Lucius's, and he does uncover the truth, and he do, uncovers some very dark truth indeed. The third book is in the voice of Watson himself. This is, of course, the whole thing is building toward that. And right from the beginning, from this episode with the slave boy, Joseph, um, you have Watson's voice, which varies every chapter. It gets wilder and wilder, and yes. But in the end, Watson um, knows who he is. He evades it at first. He dodges the implications. He does this and that. In the end, he goes, he faces what he is. And he goes back to Chukaluski, where he's killed. He doesn't have to. He's in his own boat. He could go to Key West or someplace and escape. And I think, I think the reader will understand why. He doesn't know he's going to be killed. He thinks he might bluff himself through it once again. But uh, in a way, it's also it's a self-destructive thing he does. Um, well, anyhow, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that sounds more like it, yes. Okay, welcome back. Um, how about I kick off with a question, see what, uh, what happens. Okay. Um, I was very struck by, uh, by the end of that uh, passage you read there. Um, uh, Watson's uh, apologizing for my, my unmanly feelings um, when he uh, feels a little emotion at the, at the death of the uh, man who might have described as his friend, after all, Joseph. Um, is that what it's all about, uh, the, the whole work, what it is to be a man, to have manly feelings, and to the how this... The Watsons are, are a very doer <coughs> Presbyterian, or Baptist, or Methodist, anyway, Presbyterian, Scots family, really, that's where they come from, and they're very tough, they're thrifty, and hard-working, and they're not sentimental people. And for him to have these feelings about a young, a colored boy, I guess he is, is taken aback. He's startled by his own emotions here. So he's being, you know, manly, saying all mm -hmm. manly things. But he's also it shows he has a certain openness. He understands he sees certain things about himself. Yeah, I can see how that would work psychologically or culturally, like no. you say. But uh, isn't this a, 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 a deeper? Isn't there a deeper level to this? Uh, I, I mean, uh, isn't perhaps the whole book about this, in a way, what it is to be a man and to, and to have feelings and come yeah. to terms with them? Uh, and uh, d what I would like to uh, ask you, really, is whether this specific case of Mr. Watson offers any general information on this topic, because it does seem to me to be a tremendous full-length portrayal of an American male a particular case but also of you know a human being what it is to be a human being or is that well, too pretentious I, I, I think i think we see very early that watson is we see he's a human being but you also see the process of where he just seals himself over he develops this crust as a defense against his mm -hmm. parents first of all his 
his abusive and violent father, but his mother, who is cynical and plays games with the whole family and, and risks her children, risks those beatings by taunting. She hates her husband so much that she taunts him, and when he's drunk, and then he beats her and the children. And, he, and Edgar doesn't really know which one he, he hates more. And uh, so he just seals this off. And one uncle or cousin takes him in and, and is kind to him and tries to take care of him. And then he loses that hold, too, uh, because of being falsely implicated in this, in this death, in this, in a sense, lynching. And um, so by the time he's through with that, he's 17 and he's driven from home, and he's on his own. But by this time also, he's a very capable farmer, a very expert, capable farmer, and goes to Florida. And in those days, you know, uh, he was, this is still early, this is about 1870. Kids 14 and 15 years old were foremen on some of these plantations. Uh, so 17, he was already considered a grown man, or he should have been a grown man. Hmm. We don't see things quite the same way anymore. We have, we have children in the house 40 years old who aren't grown up in some ways. Still. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very largely about the psychology of violence, in fact, is it not? And uh, it is, also the that, sociology that, of violence. That would, be, that would be simplifying it. The way he, yeah, sure. Edgar feels that he has, he has no shot unless he takes it. He's finally driven to that. He has a bad reputation. He's been driven out. He's lost his family hold. He's lost his ancestral plantation, which he means to get back. He means to go back. Between he had a between his grandfather, who was probably weak or sickly or ineffectual, and his father, who was a total loss. They've lost their connection to the Watson plantations in South Carolina, of which he is very proud, and he. That's his birthright. He feels, I'm going to go back and, and take that, as necessary, but he needs the wherewithal and the, you know, and the capital and everything else. And he has nothing, and he has to make it on his own. He's a real mm -hmm. family, and he's a, he becomes very hard. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I'm fascinated by the way this book um, is so minute in a way. It starts off with this, with this it's all about this one man, this, this one man's fate. Yeah, and uh, this very yeah. narrow little, yeah. very narrow society actually too, yeah, yeah. and yet at the same time it's vast and panoramic. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a kind of uh, epitome of, of uh, yeah. Now it sounds that sounds terribly sort of vague and pretentious, but it is, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it is a book about. Were you conscious of writing an Amer It is an American epic, with a very uh, uh, growing, which has grown out of a tiny. Donne, as Henry James would put it. Well, I didn't start out to write an American epic. I really started. Out to write <laughs> but it turned into one. But you know, but yes, but during Watson's life, of course, he's he is born a few years before the Civil War. He's raised during the Civil War, very very hard time, and famine, and, yeah. and, and uh, the family living in great poverty and uh, humiliation because they're poor relations on the Watson estates, yeah. you know. And then everything else is happening. This is the development. He, in his lifetime, the world goes from horse travel to airplanes. The first yeah. airplanes were being experimented yeah. with before he dies in 1910. Yeah. But you know, and, and overnight almost, we went from whale oil, that suddenly kerosene, suddenly the steam engines, yeah. the railroads came in, air travel. And he's watching this happen, automobiles, yeah. everything. And where is he? He's being left in the dust, which drives him absolutely nuts. But we do see this happening. The America of a new century coming up is coming up. Everybody is so excited about it. And he's there, and he also sees America's brief but ugly uh, imperialistic period, where suddenly they saw all the European nations, nations grabbing off huge chunks of Asia and Africa, mm -hmm. and these colonies, and they had, uh, America had no colonies. So they ended up beating up on the poor Spaniards, who, who were, uh, by that time, a rather rickety nation, and America just grabbed their colonies in the New World, really, in effect, mm -hmm. and uh, then went on to the Philippines and took that too, and Hawaii, and, and these were all rather pathetic <coughs> conquests, and brought us nothing but trouble, you know, and humiliation, really. <laughs> 
but uh, nonetheless, that was a jingoistic time, President Teddy Roosevelt and so forth. And Watson was a party to all of this. And he, Watson knew how to make contacts. Watson understood very early how the game works. And he's Governor John Hammond, I quoted in the epigraph. John Hammond was not a savory fellow either, but he understood how the game works in the capitalist society. And he says, Sir, what is it that constitutes character, popularity, and power in the United States? Sir, it is property, and that only. Uh, yeah. Edgar Watson learns that lesson, and he's very careful to make the good contacts wherever he goes. He knows how to work things, and he also pays his bills. He learns that if you have the merchants in the community behind you, you can get away with just about anything. And uh, he does get away with just about anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and all this history is seen uh, from a peculiar angle, isn't it? Because it's all seen from from this very pro provincial and, na and narrow uh, community that you describe here. Yes, isn't it? What, yeah. but he is also a reader, so he has a little. Yeah. yeah. See, Watson, you know, when he's when he's young, he's working on his on his uncle's plantation. He has no friends. His only friend was this black kid. Yeah. And he's all alone. He tries to get his grandfather's old house going again. And he's just living there all alone by himself with a little bit of, not much hospitality, a little bit of help from his cousins. And he just reads there in the dark. He, 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 he sleeps next to the pigs because he has no other yeah. companions. And, he's re and, and books were his only yes. thing. So he, he's, not un he's, he's not totally unlettered. He's just... Uh, um, Sparely, rather. <laughs> but you're writing about you're writing about the world without any without any of the sort of social amenities or complexities that we yeah. tend to take for granted. Yeah. It's, it's the world which Henry James considered un, unfit for for a novelist, of course. <laughs> he couldn't have. So you 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 have yeah. uh, you know so doing the job that Henry James might have done. Henry uh, had James he been was, the, was, was essentially a novelist, <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. which is what he. Well, very I think there's something very American him. about him too, but. Uh, he, d he didn't want to grapple with this, with this particular sort of raw material, obviously. He wrote about Americans abroad, if that's what you mean. But he's, yeah. uh, in all his sensibilities, he uh, seems to me... Uh, well, he's yeah. a New England. Uh, well, New yes, England okay. England I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. almost ridiculous to talk about Henry James in here, because, but, uh, but uh, uh, he does come to mind to, 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 yeah, as a contrast, uh, because uh, you are precisely dealing with, with very raw material. It is yeah. very raw. Yeah. And, uh, and rough, and, uh, and this uh, seems to ha has a great deal to do with, with all the violence, the very palpable violence that you describe so, uh, yeah, uh, hair-raisingly. Um, and I suppose it all, does it ha all have to do with the, the speed with which everything happened in America, the violence with which the, the, the wilderness was uh, domesticated, and the, and, the, and, the, and the local population uh, Eradicated or, or treated like uh, cattle or worse, yeah, yeah. and uh, slave labor used in sport, sort of contempt for, 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 for human dignity that uh, prevail, yeah. prevailed. Um, yeah. and, the, and the American Indian people, too, who were in many areas were yes. also slaves. Uh, they didn't. Uh, yes. Who, and you've, and you've, you've done your bit for, for the American Indians, of course. I have a question, actually, from the from the from somebody about on that subject. How do you feel about the recent complications in the case of Leonard Peltier? Well, that's a, uh, you're going to have to explain that a bit, perhaps. A bit. Leonard Peltier is as they he pronounces Peltier. Peltier sorry. Yeah. Well, he's no. It should be Peltier. Ah. Uh, there, are, there are lots of American Indians out in the, that part of the North Central West who have whose veins come down from French. Of Canadian trappers and people who were mixing with the Indian uh, tribal groups at that time on the plains. And so there are many French names among Indians. And this man is one of them, Leonard Peltier. And um, Peltier, they say out there. Um, <coughs> and he is doing two life terms for allegedly murdering two FBI 
FBI agents on Pine Ridge Reservation in 1975, and I've gotten very interested in this case, and we're still working to get him out. He was railroaded into prison, and uh, we're trying to get films made, and we've had all kinds of big filmmakers have toyed with it, but they're toying with a man's life, but people like Redford and Oliver Stone and even Steven Seagal, to my horror, <laughs> just made a letter dealing with Steven Seagal. But, yeah. um, <laughs> anyhow, we, we are we're still fighting. Anybody who knows about that case never gives up on it. And I've, I've managed, I know the White House knows about the case. We're trying to get commutation of the sentence. And we believe that actually that <coughs> President Clinton is, is sympathetic, but President Clinton you know, his heart's in the right place, but he's not going to sacrifice a vote for anything as small as that. Um, so, it's a touchy thing. We're not making much progress, and Leonard is still in prison. He's been in there for 27 years now. His oh. life is pretty well been taken away from him. And he's a very brave man. He doesn't ever whine. He's, uh, he's quite a guy. But uh, that's where it is. We haven't got him out yet. But we're not giving up. It's, uh, The microphone is not doing its work. <laughs> really, you don't hear it back there. Well, I'll try to, I'll try to project a bit more. <laughs> How far back is it not working? It How long has this been going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible to learn after the course of a whole evening. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> would you mind saying that? Would you mind repeating that? Yes. Uh huh. Would you mind repeating the evening, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, you admit at one point uh, that you're not interested in the plot, mm -hmm. and uh, only in, not in what happens, only in how it happens, and that's why you've structured the books the way I'm you have. I'm interested in story, not plot. Oh, would you mind telling us the difference? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I see a difference. It may, it may be a false one, and I've actually never t attempted to define it. I think of plot as being kind of a rather automatic vehicle that keeps the thing, greasing the skids, keeping the thing going with all people coming on and off stage. Story is the real essential thing that has metaphoric content and so forth that you are you're trying to tell. That in a sense, it includes whatever message you have or whatever thing that stirs you. You know, we go back again to what. I think for writers, I, I, I've cited somewhere, I was very taken with an image that Philip Roth um, uses, this idea of the magnet. That somehow the first thing that strikes you about a, a story or a novel you eventually write is something that may lay dormant for a very long time, but it's what moves you and it's what draws you to write the story. And you have to follow that magnet all the way through. If you deviate too far, your story just begins to wander, it becomes loose and slack. And if you are loyal, if you're faithful to the magnet and follow it consistently with intensity and passion, the reader inevitably will be drawn in by that magnet too and will follow you to the end. And I don't know for other writers. I, I do know for me, I always have the, the ending in my mind. There's always some place. I'm pretty sure what it is. I, don't, I, I never write it first, but I, I know where I'm going. And often people wish I would dispense with a lot of stuff I, I present on the way there. Um, but I, yeah, I do that in nonfiction too. I, I, uh, mm -hmm. Almost always have some some culminating chapter which is the important, one. and I notice this a lot. There's an anthology of my nonfiction being done in the states now, and uh, and I notice how many of my books that the chapter that meant the most to me by far was the last chapter, and it always did. It always was the one that the whole thing was being directed towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Particularly the snow leopard, but we do, you don't talk about the snow leopard. No. Well, actually, um, the snow leopard, yes, it was. There was, there was a man, a Sherpa, in there named Tuxton, Tuxton Sherpa, 
who I saw as a great shaman, an extraordinary figure, and he taught me a lot. And uh, I'm sorry, I've heard from another Sherpa who was with us since then that Tipton has died, probably of cirrhosis of the liver because he was a heavy uh, drinker. But there was rather a funny story, a rather funny thing that happened to about two or three years after the Snow Leopard journey. I was supposed to meet Tuckton somewhere. He said, well, well, we'll meet here, and he never showed up at all. It's what we call a silent teacher. Zen, uh, where you, you deal with your ego and your irritation and your <laughs> annoyance that you've been you know, frustrated. Well, a couple of years later, I was at home in America, and a woman called up. And she'd obviously nerved herself for this phone call with a couple of martinis or something. She, <clears throat> you know, I could tell it. She was in a rather excited state. And she said, you're going to think I'm crazy. I said, well, I don't know yet, because you haven't told me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> <I said, laughs> yes. And she said, well, I'm just back from Nepal. And we were doing a, a, a trek around Muktinath that way. And we came across another trekking party. And one of their Sherpas came over, who knew our Sherpa, and said, you American? And I said, yes, I'm American. And he said, give mass. And he thrust into her hand this disreputable looking uh, paper bag. <laughs> and she said, wait, wait, uh, I am American, but uh, who is Masson? And he said, give Masson. He was, he was rather rude, maybe drunk. And um, he just knew, because he's a shaman, that she would find me. He, didn't, he was impatient with her. She said, look, uh, America's a big country. You're not giving me enough to go on. And he just very impatiently kept front. And she said, finally, he seemed so sure that I, that I would find the, the system that uh, I took it. I never dared look in. He said, she thought this man was quite strange. And uh, she said, I, and I came home still carrying this rather dirty, greasy paper bag sort of thing. And I was met by my daughter at the plane, and my daughter said, Oh, mummy, it's, so, it's wonderful to see you because just guess what? While you're in Nepal, this series about Nepal came out in the New Yorker magazine, <laughs> written by somebody named Peter Matheson. And uh, she said, Oh, I can't think this is true. <laughs> oh, no, 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 not possible. And she called up the Explorers Club, and, and, uh, and there's no maths in there. I've never joined. Forest Cubs is full of non explorers <laughs> 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 uh, And there's no maths in obviously one. And she tried a few other sources, she told me. And finally, in desperation, she went back to this fortuitous event, namely her daughter, telling her about this article. And she got my number and called me. And I said, What did that Sherpa look like? And she described it. And I said, Send the parcel. I'm sure it was Tuckton, and I was especially convinced when I opened the parcel, because in it it had, it's a, it's a rather an odd, uh, you, can, you can actually, you can, you can find it in the shops there in Kathmandu, around there, but not, not common. It's a delusion cutting knife, it's a half crescent moon with a, what's called a dorji bell handle, and a little loop at the end of it. It's a rather an odd looking thing that might be used for cutting cakes or something. Uh, but that's what it is. It's a symbolic knife used by the Lamas to cut the delusion of mankind and so forth. And Tuckton would certainly send me a delusion cutting knife as any good teacher in China would do. So I feel that that came from him. So I was very happy about that. I was very happy to have his knife, which is in my office to this day, and has not cut all my delusions by any means. <laughs> but uh, there it is. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. terrific. Exten extension to the book. Yeah, yeah. Tuck, Tuck Ten Tuck is, is, a, is a great yeah. character. Yeah. Um, and he's like Mr. Watson in a way that uh, you understand him and you don't understand him. He's there and he isn't. Absolutely yeah, ambiguous. The other Sherpas were very frightened of him. They hated him and they kept him out. Yeah, yeah. You, you're drawn to people with this. Or, or, yeah. Well, only doubleness. 
I did because he, 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 he was looking out for me. I had the uh -huh. this guy was really looking out for me. And, and he guided me out. I went out, I separated from my partner, George Scheller, the great zoologist. And George uh, stayed on and he went out by a different route. And Tuckton was my yeah. guide out. And he was marvelous. And when we got finally to a big, uh, or big for that part of the world, a big town, Hula, in western Nepal, uh, the way, when he walked into town, the way that people treated him was, I thought, my God, and, and, and Tukton was the most disreputable little guy. His, he was just, his clothes were dirty and he had a, a baseball cap on backwards and he was dressed because he had no clothes of his own. I'd given him all my clothes that I could spare just to keep him warm because we were going over these high passes. And he was going over virtually barefooted in a sweatshirt. <laughs> and so he had these clothes which were twice his size. I mean, they really were ridiculous. <laughs> I'm in his baseball pack, back with my pack, you know, something, you know, I have my pack and he had another thing. He didn't look like much, but people really made way for him. So I knew I was in the presence of a teacher then, you know. Not just your, your, your imagination and no, novels? I don't think so. Right. Sure, but I mean, George right. Howard thought yeah. about it, he was convinced that I was completely... But he was not initiated into the mysteries. <laughs> no. It all sounds extraordinarily fascinating and, uh, and uh, enviable, but uh, I guess t it takes a long time to, to perceive these things. Um, or you start hallucinating and think you perceive them. <laughs> <laughs> They're shortcuts, as yeah. Well, as is the alternative explanation, which I'm, <laughs> I'm open to, but I don't believe it. Uh -huh. mm. And the, uh, the um, um, rather stupid suggestion I made, rather, um, Simplified suggestion. Uh, is there anything in that that uh, the, the 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 charity, the 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 uh, refusal to play God in your books? Does this have anything to do with Zen? I mean, I, I think that I, you, you perhaps you wouldn't put it that way yourself, but I think one can say that you are a very uh, you submit to your material in a way. You don't you don't you let it go its own way. You let the story come out of it. Yeah. Has that, is that does that have anything to do with your um, philosophy? Well, no, because, I, I, or I don't think so, because I'm not, I don't consciously do that. No, it, I, 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 I felt no. a bit awkward putting this, because it yeah. sounds so self-conscious, and you would not yeah. want to be self-conscious about such a thing, presumably. Yeah. But, uh, no, I try I to think about it. Where possible, I, like to, I, I, I try to laugh at myself, because you do find yourself in uh -huh. humiliating um, <laughs> circumstances, <laughs> often, and I think that leavens any spiritual yearning that you you have in there, which is good. Spiritual yearning should always be leavened by a little bit of irony, it seems to me. Yes. But I do. I mean, Zen, I, there's a lot of irony in Zen, actually. Yeah. What? Zen, I mean, the little Zen, I know about it Zen is... Zen has uh, a lot of irony, in uh, it, yes, uh, indeed. And, and, uh, and a very hard eye on the way things really are. Yeah. I'm not much for... Um, I am a religious person, I guess, in, in some strange, informal way, and I'm, I've been a long, long time student of Zen, over 30 years now, and practitioner. And, um, and uh, there is something I, I think I see or feel or whatever, but I think that it must be, you know, uh, I, I don't like to wear it on my sleeve, no, and I don't like no. to present it in any no, kind no. of mushier, no, uh, no. gushy way, you know, so I sort of, sort of offset that, I try to, you know, well, I guess you keep can be a hard sober, eye sober about it. <laughs> sober about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It seems to me uh, 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 hard to, to, to reconcile with the with the Western with the Western life. Uh, oh, indeed, you with, were, and with pursuing you the my friends, kind of goals that you pursue yeah. and uh, political activism. Uh, yeah. With most of my friends, I never talk about Zen. I never do. It's an unmentionable yeah. subject. Oh. My father has never brought himself to talk about it. <laughs> you're, you're only able to talk about it in public. <laughs> or anywhere, <laughs> even to me. You know, he, uh, he's never, he, for him it's just, uh, not, that he, not because he's a, uh, I mean he's an Episcopalian way back somewhere, but it's not that, it's just that it's just too strange. And he's rather sorry that I've engaged in the strange exotic 
<coughs> practice. I guess he is, because he's never confided in me one way or the other. Yeah. He's, a, he's a real gentleman. He keeps his opinion to himself. He doesn't uh, jeer at it or anything. But um, I know that. And most of my friends are quite uncomfortable about it. And I don't proselytize or talk about it yeah. if it comes up. Yes, I, I, you know, the, other, the strangest people show up in the, in the Zendo. People you wouldn't expect, like Saul Steinberg, the artist cartoonist. Oh, really? you know, yeah, Saul came quite a lot. And he got a lot out of it, even though he was a very re removed, tight, cold-seeming cold man. You, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you never know, but he, he had a very clear mind, and he saw something about it. Jung, you know, the great Jung was very drawn to Zen. It was the last thing he was reading when he died. It was about Zen practice. So interesting minds are, are drawn. Far more interesting than my thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. But I've crept in under the no. banner of the... <laughs> no, I don't think yeah. we have to agree with you there. Um, I'd like to th throw it open to you. Um, who has... Uh, anything that they would like to ask? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. You seem to have a dual career as a writer, non-fiction and fiction. To what extent has your previous experience seen wildness, violence, everything can be influence your fictional writing? One person, another one is less serious. <laughs> I've been trying to subdue that photograph for years, but my my British publishers will not. They keep using publisher. Um, that was taken about <coughs> you me through eight years ago, six years ago. I think. <laughs> anyway, it's pretty pretty grim photograph. <laughs> it's slightly better than the one that appeared in your newspapers here. Where I'm Oh. <laughs> I'm gulping herrings to beat the band out there on the bridge, but um, anyway, that's to get dispensed with that. That's about what that is. Um, and the other was about violence and how much I'd seen in my life that I then put in my. Uh, I haven't seen a great deal of violence in my life. I've seen a few people killed, but usually by cars or something like that. Um, no, I, I don't know. I don't think it's hard to. Um, I'm not. You know, I do. I do talk about the by far the most violent scene in the book is the one you read. I don't talk about. I talk about. I discuss well, one of Watson's killings. The Tucker there are quite killing. A few, there are quite a few uh, bullets flying around and shooting. Well, yes, but not but not an it. awful lot of gore and and uh, getting down to the nitty gritty. Of one it, does so. read, but one does one does know what it's like. I don't know whether you made it up, but yeah. one knows what it's like to be present at a shooting. Yeah, yeah. Well, which I didn't necessarily but that is, know before. That is, after all, we do have, uh, alas, we do have TV. Oh, yes. There are more people killed on TV in a week than Watson ever dreamed about. You but know, very often it's but, but so often it's dreamlike, isn't it? Well, good, yes, good but filmmaker. But sometimes it is. Sometimes it, it is. Some of these are, are extremely vivid. Mm -hmm. You get the idea of what it what it looks like. When somebody yeah. sudden, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to think about you. I think we are exposed to a lot of violence in our daily life, and you do see a certain amount, and you can imagine it, and you've been with loved ones when they die, and you you get a rough idea of what uh, death is about. I don't think that takes a great deal of you know imagination to reimagine, and in a sense, that's that's the novelist's. Um, task, you have to uh, reimagine things you don't know about personally. You, you cannot experience everything. Um, but in this case, it was, it's necessary, it's, it's an important ingredient in Watson's life, and I have to deal with that, you know. But I don't, um, I don't like dwelling on it, I have to say. Except I wanted that lynching to be truly terrible, and even worse than the lynching, the, the, the carnival atmosphere, the people being photographed who are eating a corn on the cob while they're, you know, uh, <clears throat> this kind of thing that they could hold fellow beings in such 
low regard. It's just the, the old thing of the other, the stranger, the other, the Holocaust, the, you name it. This is what human beings do. This is what I was talking about last night in London. We, as a species, we really have not made much progress. I mean, genocide is the, na is the nature of our species. We, it's just as bad now as it ever was. We've made no progress whatsoever for all of our churches and do-gooder groups and our idea that we are technologically so civilized. You press the right button, we're right in there slitting throats, as in Serbia. You know, uh, we, we just simply don't seem to be, make that. We don't. One, one side of our nature is going forward in terms of accomplishment. Our hands get more and more, and our brain more and more handy and more nimble for mischief and theft and <laughs> greed. But that other side of our being is still back where it was in the Stone Age. It has made no progress, and nor will it. Because as I tried to suggest last night, you know, there's no more possibility of isolation of a human population that could evolve. We cannot evolve any further. We are stuck with who and what we are right now. So we have to make our accommodations to account for this side of our species. We are a very a magnificent species, an incredible species, but we are also terrible. And we all don't make any exceptions. We all have this potential for violence. And the book is, in, to a certain degree, about that. We think we don't. Most of us, fortunately, are spared any circumstance where we would have to be violent. Most of us get through life without ever being close to it. And we think, how can people treat each other like that? Well, you press the button, somebody comes in and threatens your child or your whatever it is, and especially if they're another group or they're the wrong color or the economy is, you know, and it's amazing how fast we can revert to something else. And I think that until we face that about ourselves, we're not going to make much progress about dealing with it. We're going to have, we have about, I think somebody estimates about 50 small and large ethnic strife, different ones going on in the world right now, as we sit here. People are killing one another all over the world, and they always have, and they always will. And we have not found the apparatus, the technique, and the way of stopping it, because we are not facing, I believe, who we are. And I was discussing this with our friend Katerina today. We, uh, you know, this may be that over-specialty Every species that's gone extinct has become over-specialized in some way. And our brain may be our over-specialization that's going to doom us. It may make us unfit for survival in the world. Incredible as it is, uh, this may be our great dangerous flaw. So from that point of view, I am interested in violence. And I want, and I, but, but in this case, in this book, what I really want, I wanted to rub my fellow citizens knows we haven't faced in America what slavery was. We have never faced it. We're constantly talking about human rights in other countries. We have never faced up to what we have done and are still doing to a certain extent. The humiliations even to this day we impose on black people, even though it's much, much more civilized and many black people have made it into the middle class and so forth and, and certainly things have become a great deal better. But uh, they aren't great. If I were a young black man in America today and thinking of my ch chances of a good education or any kind of a, uh, a decent uh, life for myself and my family, I would be so angry. I'm amazed we have so little crime. Not that we have crime. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed we have so little. Yeah. I would be a criminal <laughs> all the way <laughs> if I were those guys. And think all over the world. Right now, we have 200 million more people living in poverty than we had 10 years ago. We're not making any progress. And here are these corporate heads giving themselves two and a half million dollars a year in compensation. Mr. Bill Gates of Microsoft sitting on 91 billion dollars. Do you realize that's the equivalent of the 106 million poorest Americans? That's what their net worth is, about $91 million. He has that much money all by himself. Why? What for? Uh, optimist, I wouldn't say. 
But anyhow, I'm going to keep on blasting away on this subject because I think we're not, as I was talking about last night, we are not facing it. We, we all are, we, we become kind of paralyzed by the, we think it's out of our hands and for the moment it is. We've given everything over to these huge corporations. They run the governments, they own these governments, they certainly own our government, I can't speak for Holland. They own the American government. The national elections are a farce. This Mr. George W. Bush <coughs> Jr., Bush the Younger, has already amassed $50 million. Do you think these companies are just giving him $50 million for the fun of it? They're giving him $50 million because he's their boy, and he will do what he's told when he gets in there. He has no qualifications whatsoever. But he's a good Republican, and he'll help the corporations. So why vote, you know? And we're talking about that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm I've got off my soapbox. I when, I, when I do that, That's you've so got to get fun. me off that soapbox at it's once. Really terrific. Know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Ah, well, I have a new book on um, on tigers. I'm working on on tiger conservation. And I've been working in Siberia with a tiger with conservation biologists working over there. The Siberian tiger, there are a few hundred of them. And they luckily have an almost uninhabited area. Unfortunately, they do take occasional human beings, even though the area is, because there's so few people, it's a measurable fraction of the population. <laughs> um, so there is some resentment. <laughs> On the other hand, the human beings are eating all of their food, so they really don't have an awful lot of uh, choice. Uh, but nonetheless, we feel that the Siberian race of the tiger has a better shot than the Indian tiger, the Bengal circus zoo tiger, because the habitat of the Bengal tiger is just being contracted. And so many people, I was very pleased to learn, for example, that the World Wildlife Fund had raised, um, what was it, $30 million for, a new, for establishing new tiger parks in India. That was about 1970. And um, they raised $30 million over a certain period. And then I read another statistics. I realized that for every one of those dollars, 10 new human beings have been born. It was 30 million times 10. 300 million new human beings just in that period in the 1970s in India. So you see the tiger uh, are crowded there. Um, Anyway, I'm working on that because the tigers are, uh, uh, in a way, is what we call an indicator species. As they go, many other species will go. And I'm also doing a book on the cranes of the world. There are 15 species of cranes. I've just been up in, um, in Norfolk, in England, um, where the crane has come back to the same marsh it was last seen in in 1659. And after a 330-year hiatus, it has reappeared in this marsh and seems to be reestablishing itself as a how British how species. How come? Well, people immediately think that somehow in the gene memory of cranes, they remember that old grand old marsh in England, and oh my God, let's get back there someday. Well, that's not really quite how it worked. They were exterminated in England, presumably, and uh, then they're doing perhaps quite well in, in perhaps here in Holland. I don't know the Eurasian crane. I think you have a few crane. of them here. Certainly in eastern Denmark, they have them in some places in Germany. And, um, and perhaps a small over, or perhaps just an accident. Just a pair just got lost on the wind or in a storm and saw this nice looking marsh, little knowing that their kind had been there 300 years before. And anyway, they've now reestablished themselves. So I went up to see. We have, we have green pa parrots in, in Amsterdam. I haven't seen any Do cranes. We have, we, have, we have Brazilian parrots in the parks in Amsterdam. Really? We have, the parrots, we have quite a few in New York now, too. <laughs> parrots are all the best. Yeah. The mountain parrots that are tough. Yeah, they're, they're yeah tough. They're hardy. The yeah. 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 yeah, monk parrot, monk parakeets mm. and stuff. Yeah. Anybody else? Then I would like to close because every evening has to come one moment or another to an end. And thank you very much, Peter Matheson and Anthony Hall, to give us insight in your wildlife and into, yeah. <laughs>
the beauty of the uh, and the riches of the uh, American language. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a solid taste that was. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to talk a little bit more to Peter Matthewson, just stay a little while, have a drink, and come to our next uh, lecture. Sunday, 24 October, American author E. Annie Prue, yeah, at yeah, noon yeah. in the Koepelzaal, so don't come here. Additional information on the lectures is in the hall, in the brochure, and please sign up as a donor if we need your support. Hope to see you again.